Okay, so good morning. Sorry about a little delay getting started. Um, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to continue the phenolics and hopefully finish the phytochemicals today. Um, we were discussing the polyphenols last week and now we're on to another group called lignans and flavonolignans. Now when we talked about um, the polyphenols originally, or the phenolic compounds, we described that they were made from the phenylpropanoid groups and um, both the lignans and the flavonolignans are derived from this as well. So to start off with the polyphenols, or the lignans, so I think most of you know that uh, flax is good for you and is considered to be a superfood. And one of the reasons for this is that it contains uh, a number of different polyphenolic compounds including lignans. Now lignans are basically made uh, in plants by combining two phenylpropanoid groups and then modifying the lipid. And these should not be confused with compounds called lignins which is basically uh, an organic polymer that's found in, in wood and it kind of helps to give the wood a better uh, structural integrity. So, um, and they're much larger kind of compounds. Um, now lignins are very, are kind of derived as well from the phenylpropanoids as well, but they're very large com complex molecules. So, um, in general when it comes to lignins, like any of the uh, polyphenol compounds, they're going to be, have great antioxidant potential. They're also going to probably have some anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, I haven't looked into that specifically. And in particular, a lot of them have uh, phytoestrogenic effects. So one of the things that flaxseed's good for is helping to um, balance female hormones. And when you grind up flax seeds uh, and consume it, let's say, for breakfast or um, with some other meal, what it basically does it has a couple of benefits. One, you're getting lots of fiber from the flax seeds itself, and that has a bulk laxative effect. Uh, two, you get the benefit of the omega threes that you get from flax seeds, uh, the omega three fatty acids, which is good for you. And then four, or maybe three, four. I don't know which number I'm at. I think I'm only at three now. Um, you get these lignans. And so these lignans basically mod modulate estrogen receptors and uh, help to balance hormones and also decrease the risk of prostate and breast cancer, which is good. Um, so the main dietary source, I think, for most people is going to be uh, flaxseed, uh, unless you're eating at like McDonald's all, all the time, and then probably you might get that, like a few of them on the sesame seeds on top of the Big Mac that you're eating, and that's about probably the only phytochemical you get from eating them at McDonald's. Um, and uh, so in general, I really recommend people eat flaxseed on a regular basis. One of the little tricks to it is you do have to grind it up to break the seed coat to liberate the fatty acids and to liberate these, these lignans. Otherwise, um, it'll just sort of pass through the system undigested because Unlike birds, we don't have a gullet uh, with little stones in it to, to break up seeds, so we have to grind it up ahead of time. Um, also, just in general, uh, when it comes to anything that contains high amounts of omega-3s, once you crack them open, they're going to be easily oxidized by um, the air, and also they can go rancid by exposure to sunlight, so that's why it's usually recommended to buy them whole and then grind them as you go with a coffee grinder or something else. And then keep it in the fridge uh, if you're going to be uh, if you're not going to use it right away. So um, now another thing with lignans that's worth mentioning is that um, the lignans in flax is often exists as a glycoside. So if you look at this compound on the upper left there, it's called SDG. Uh, it's a glycoside of uh, one of the lignans that you're going to find in in flax. And in your gut, it's going to become metabolized by a couple different things. One, the sugars will get removed. Uh, and then two, the gut flora will do some biotransformation on these compounds and, and will actually convert to something called enterolactone. And so what's interesting <clears throat> is that uh, enterolactone is considered to be, and enterodiol <clears throat> are considered to be mammalian lignans. So what that means is these are produced in the guts of mammals um, and so they 
these are the main active compounds that you get in flax that's probably having a lot of therapeutic effects in us, um, but uh, they don't exist in flax in that form. It has to be metabolized in our gut uh, by various bacteria. And this is kind of interesting that, you know, flax in a lot of ways acts as a pro-drug to give you these sort of compounds. Um, also, other phytochemicals do um, are metabolized and, and transformed by our gut flora as well, which is kind of interesting. So um, in some some groups of people, they get benefit from flax and the people don't, and maybe it's because they lack the proper gut bacteria um, to, that can metabolize these to get the maximum health benefits from it. So, and here's because these kind of can modulate uh, steroid uh, receptors. Um, this is just an example of how flax can help with BPH, which is in large prostate men. And there's also studies that show that it helps to reduce the risk of. Um, uh, like as I mentioned, different types of cancers like estrogen-based uh, uh, cancers like um, um, breast cancer and, and then prostate cancer in men, which is not estrogen-based. But Now, other herbs also have uh, lignans, including burdock root. Now, we mentioned earlier that burdock was used as an alternative to help cleanse the skin. It's also used in diets in Japan as a, as a root vegetable. It contains um, a particular lignin called Arctogenin, which you don't need to know the name of that, um, but this we do know that um, burdock was used traditionally to help cleanse the skin and with skin conditions and and uh, even for hormonal things. And it was also used as an anti-cancer substance. And so it's kind of neat to see that there are a whole bunch of different research studies with this particular compound showing that it it might have some. Um, uh, drug resistant pump inhibiting activity. It appears that it may benefit people with uh, osteoporosis. And then I don't know what, are, what this one here it says. Oh, and it may have some benefits on ovarian cancer cells. Now, obviously, most of these studies that I've just sort of quoted here are not uh, necessarily human trials. But considering burdock, I think it's fairly safe because it's a, basically a root vegetable and in some cultures. Um, certainly I would consider recommending this uh, to people if they're suffering from, from um, ovarian cancer or something else as, a, as one possible option. So, And as I mentioned before, when you're treating a lot of conditions with natural therapies, you're not just giving one thing. You're often giving multiple things to try to increase your odds of getting benefit. Uh, the only challenge is you got to try to figure out a way to do this in a cost-effective way. So we just discussed the lignans. We've already discussed flavonoids. And now we're going to talk about a group of compounds called the flavonolignans. And so these are kind of like a part lignin, part flavonoid. Uh, so they're kind of like a, you know, like a centaur, half man, half, half horse. So it kind of bridges these two um, classes of compounds. And there are a few different sort of classic ones that we can mention. Milk thistle has a number of flavonolignans, including psilibin, uh, which has been so, shown to have a number of beneficial effects. Um, it has a strong antioxidant effect. It's going to potentially uh, act as a powder protective agent. Um, in milk thistle, this may be one of the compounds that basically helps to stimulate liver regeneration, um, may help with certain detox pathways. And we know that both milk thistle, barberry, golden seal contain flavonolignans that appear to inhibit p glycoprotein. So these are also referred to as the multi-drug resistant pumps. Uh, so the antibiotic properties of uh, golden seal and barberry is not attributed to these flavonolignans. It's attributed to the isoquinoline alkaloids that we'll talk about later on. But these compounds are the ones that inhibit the multi-drug resistant pumps. Um, and these same pumps are not only used by bacteria, but they're also used by cancer cells to uh, help uh, protect the, the, uh, uh, the, the cancer cells from the chemotherapeutic agents, and that's responsible for um, the drug resistance. So if we can knock them out with things like milk thistle or some, some other herb that contains these, maybe we can get better effects from the chemotherapy. And there's one study there that I just mentioned how it works to reverse the multi-drug resistance 
uh, and can, may work synergistically with chemotherapeutic drugs, which is pretty cool. Now the next group of compounds are all kind of related. These are coumarins, furanocoumarins, and phthalides. These may or may not be phenolic compounds. I don't really consider them to be true phenolic compounds because uh, they've been modified in a way uh, that they may no longer have a, a, a functional phenolic group. But they're derived from the same phenylpropanoid pathways and they start off as phenolic compounds before they're made into these three classes. And so if you look over here, these would technically be described as phenylpropanoid lactones. And so if we take something like cinnamic acid, you throw a little OH group on there, and now it becomes hydroxycinnamic acid, which is technically, this is a phenolic group at the top. And then you do a little modification, a little cyclization, and then you get a compound called coumarin. And coumarins and these other compounds are uh, quite abundant in nature. Um, the coumarin molecule on the right, technically speaking, it's not a um, phenolic compound because the OH group on the on the uh, benzene ring, uh, benzene ring is no longer um, free and able to accept and donate electrons because it's attached to the uh, to the carboxylic acid group on the end there, and that's called the lactone group over here, and so that lactone group is going to behave differently than a phenolic group does. Now you can add some OH groups onto the coumarin ring on the left and that'll uh, change some of the properties a little bit. Uh, but in general, uh, that's coumarin is the basic backbone structure for the coumarins. And across the top there's a whole bunch of different compounds here, coumarins, uh, molecules depending on where the OH group is attached or if there's no H in a methyl group. And these compounds are found in a lot of the members of the APAC family which includes uh, things like um, uh, let's say Garden Angelica contains these uh, and I would also say Don Quai does uh, and then other herbs like cranberry or um, uh, high bush cranberry or, or cramp bark a horse chestnut contains these compounds and they may have some beneficial effects for um, dilating smooth muscles, uh, helping with uh, stagnation in, in the blood or in the lymphatic tissue. Sorolin, which is in the bottom left, is a furanocoumer and that's a special class of compounds uh, that we'll talk about shortly. And then the phthalides in the bottom right are also important uh, smooth muscle relaxants. So I would say the phthalides and the coumarins both share the same properties as being smooth muscle relaxants and um, have some beneficial effects on lowering blood pressure. Uh, some of them may have an effect on menstrual cramps because it helps to relax the smooth muscles. Um, the sorolin and the phranocoumarins we'll talk about in their own thing, they have some other unique properties. So with coumarin, um, if I'm sure most of you have smelt, if not everyone has smelt uh, coumarin before. If you go and cut your grass in the summertime, you have this very unique smell of you know, freshly mowed grass. That's the coumarins that are basically becoming volatile that you're smelling. And coumarins are found in most plants to some degree. Or I don't know most plants. They're found in a lot of plants anyways. And they are found in some of the spices and foods that we eat as well. Uh, they're bicyclic compounds um, that have a number of effects on the smooth muscles, as I mentioned. So they have antispasmodic effect. They have some, some of these herbs are classified as being lymphatics or helping with anti-edema effects, helping with people swelling their ankles and some of them will lower blood pressure. So red clover, um, it does contain some other compounds like isoflavonoids and it's been used um, because it's a cousin basically of, of soy, it's been used for hormonal issues but in historical herbal medicine uh, it has relatively high amounts of coumarin and that's been used as a bronchodilator for a croupy cough. So it's a different indication when the whole herb is used versus the uh, isolated isoflavonoids. Um, also, cinnamon bark, uh, in particular Chinese cinnamon, is relatively high in coumarin. We're, we'll discuss that later as a health concern. Um, cramp bark uh, is a useful herb for helping with menstrual cramps and uh, can also lower blood pressure and do a few other things. It contains different coumarins. 
horse chestnuts used primarily as a denotonic um, for varic varicosities and edema um, and varicose, varicose veins and, and it's even used for hemorrhoids, it's used for swelling in the ankles. <clears throat> so the idea is it sort of helps, a lot of these things help with stagnation and, and, and relaxing smooth muscles. Now a couple things to be aware of is that there are some concerns that they may not directly have an anticoagulant effect but things like Coumadin, um, which is related to Coumarins, does um, uh, it's basically a blood thinner. Uh, it's also a rat poison, and so coumarins may interact with that to some degree. Um, the other thing to be concerned about is that some of these coumarins have hepatotoxic effects. So coumarin itself is does have potential risk for um, uh, causing like a drug-induced hepatitis. So there have been reports of people eating a lot of cinnamon in certain countries that's high in coumarin, especially the Chinese cinnamon, and it having some um, uh, issues with the liver and a small percentage of the people. Um, true cinnamon from Sri Lanka doesn't have that same uh, health concern. So just be aware that coumarins do have the potential to be damaging to the kidneys and to the liver. So uh, we'll discuss that more in the safety lecture. Uh, cinnamon on the left, yellow clover is another herb in, in addition to red clover that has these coumarins and red, yellow clover has been used for lymphatic congestion and, and some varicosities as well. And then here's cramp bark, uh, high bush cranberry is also called. It has a couple different coumarins in it. Now just as an aside, it appears that when you have basically OH groups on the ring structure, um, and this is a different type of coumarin, not just pure coumarin itself. Coumarin is one type of coumarin of the coumarins. Um, and so the two shown on the right here, they seem to have less hepatotoxicity than just pure coumarin on its own. So uh, it may be that herbs like cramp bark are safer because the coumarins are different. Here's horse chestnut on the left hand side and uh, asculin is one of the compounds that may have some beneficial effects for uh, venous insufficiency, varicose veins, and things like that. Um, it can exist as a glycoside. Again, you can add a sugar onto these OH groups. So that's about it with the coumarins. <clears throat> now moving on to the ferrano coumarins. I'm sure most of you have heard that you're not supposed to take grapefruit juice if you're on certain medication. And that's because of certain coumarins in the grapefruit called, like for example, bergamotin. Um, and so there's a couple things that you need to know about these. I don't know what they do from a medicinal standpoint, but there are some uh, concerns with this from a, from, from a safety standpoint. So um, in general, something to be aware of is that these can cause severe burns if you get them on topically on your skin and then are exposed to sunlight. So they can act as photosensitizers. So people who harvest grapefruit uh, or are uh, exposed to um, these frantocormorins and other herbs like wild parsnip and giant hogweed will get severe burns from it. So that's one thing. The second thing is it can basically inhibit phase one detox in the liver and so if you're taking a statin drug, it can elevate those drugs in your body. And then the third thing is some of them, uh, in particular the, the aflatoxins that are made by certain fungi, <clears throat> can increase the risk of liver cancer. Now when we discuss safety of stuff, of herbs, we'll go through this <clears throat> in a little bit more detail then. Um, now, you can read this on your own, but the basic message is that uh, there's a fungus called Aspergillus that it grows everywhere. It's particularly <clears throat> an issue in tropical countries like Indonesia and Thailand, where they eat a lot of uh, a lot of uh, nuts or other grains, and it tends to be a very moist, humid <clears throat> climate. And so, if peanuts and grains aren't stored properly, then this Aspergillus fungus can grow in these grains, and then uh, as a byproduct, they produce aflatoxins, and it's well known that aflatoxins, um, when they are metabolized by the liver, it does increase the risk of getting uh, free radical damage and, and, and uh, liver cancer later on. And so we monitor how much aflatoxins in our peanut butter in North America and uh, make sure that it's not too high because of the it poses a real threat. Um, in other tropical countries, uh, they probably don't do that. <clears throat> and so 
What's interesting though is that if you're eating a diet that's rich in, in members of the APACA family, so carrots, parsnips, celery, <clears throat> what's neat about that is it appears that those compounds uh, that are in the APACA family, it does contain other sorolins and coumarins that appear to displace the aflatoxins from the liver and reduce their metabolism in the liver. And I think what happens is that aflatoxin, when it's metabolized by the liver, becomes a reactive intermediate or, or has some sort of toxicity after it's been metabolized in the liver. And so if you eat lots of similar compounds that are safe, it'll be providing for some of these uh, enzymes in the liver and, and rather than becoming activated, it'll just be passed out of the liver. So, which is neat. Um, <clears throat> so even drinking grapefruit juice, which is a, is not an aflatoxin, but it is a furanocoumarin, does seem to help, um, does help protect against aflatoxin. Also, the other thing that's interesting, for example, is that smokers who drink grapefruit juice, uh, because the grapefruit juice inhibits the P450 enzymes, the, type, um, the phase one detox enzymes, um, it tends to reduce the amount of reactive intermediates and decrease, it has a little bit of a protective effect against smoking. So if you smoke, drink some grapefruit juice, but if you're on statin drugs, you shouldn't take grapefruit juice. Uh, a few other little things there. <clears throat> now finally, the last group are the phthalides. Now, the research on these guys is somewhat limited. Um, I usually attribute these phthalides to uh, when you eat celery and there's that celery taste or smell to it, unique celery smell, um, I think that's a combination of these phthalides and perhaps also some coumarins. But uh, these phthalides are going to be act as, uh, they're fairly small compounds, so they can evaporate. And um, I think the main action of these is very similar to what you get from the coumarins. They're going to act as a, uh, uh, as a smooth muscle relaxant. And so that will give it the potential to relax arteries and have a blood pressure lowering effect and it may have some antispasmodic effects or maybe have some preventative effects as well. Um, and then I think that a lot of these guys are act as uterine tonics. Now in celery it's been used traditionally as a food to help lower blood pressure and there is at least one clinical trial that shows benefit and several um, other in vitro or in vivo trials that suggest that it may do that. What's interesting is that Celery, Garden, Angelica, and Don Quai, they're all the same family. <clears throat> and they all contain, um, I believe, some type of phthalide. What's interesting with Don Quai is that it's used traditionally as a uterine tonic in Chinese medicine. And um, it has a, a antispasmodic effect and helps to increase blood flow to the, to the uterus. And I believe it's related to these phthalide compounds. As they may not be the only compound, but I believe it's one of the compounds. And what's interesting is, although Don Kwai is often referred to as Chinese ginseng in Asian medicine because it's a really good female herb, it increases, it may help with libido in women, but it's used more for um, uh, any kind of female complaint. It does not directly contain phytoestrogens, but I think it, by affecting blood flow, it has its action that way. And in addition to the phthalides, it will have some other phenolic compounds with anti-inflammatory effects as well. But um, Don Kwai is used mainly for female complaints uh, with the reproductive system, but it's also used in men. And uh, so it's not really phytoestrogen, but because it has this vasodilating effect, it's been used, there's research studies showing it may be protective for people who are, uh, who've had a stroke, it may have some beneficial effects in uh, Don Kwai could be used as a heart tonic as well. Um, and that's related to this vasodilating effect that it has. So moving on, we're going to go on to the next group, the quinones, the naphthoquinones, and the anthroquinones. We've already discussed the quinones. Uh, and you can look at these yourself. The quinones basically is the hydroquinone, benzoquinone, uh, and that's related to the arbutin. We're going to talk about naphthoquinones and anthroquinones now. So the quinones and the benzoquinones we've discussed already. Um, these usually exist as glycosides, and enough about that. Now, naphthoquinones, 
these the basically what you have with a naphthalene is you have um, basically a benzene ring attached to a quinone group. Okay, so this is your quinone. This is your benzene ring. So technically speaking, this is not a phenolic compound, right? Naphthalene is not a phenolic compound because there's no H OH groups on that on this here, but this ox these two ketone groups which are not OH groups they can accept and exchange electrons and that basically allows them to participate in redox reactions and so the classic naphthalene um, in your in your diet or as a nutrition a nutrient supplement is CoQ10 and if you think about what CoQ10 does is it basically acts as a uh, a shuttle for electrons in the body and it participates in the mitochondria and electron transport chain. So I wouldn't be surprised if these naphthalquinones um, and things like ju juglone and lawson, uh, which are traditionally used as antimicrobials, they probably exert their action by having some kind of disruption to the mitochondria in bacteria and viruses, um, uh, viral infected cells or possibly they just generate free radicals under certain conditions. So I don't know what the exact mechanism is, but they do have this potential to accept and donate electrons, and that's probably what how it functionally works. Uh, in addition, a lot of the herbs that contain them are things like black walnut. There's another herb from South America called podarco. There's also uh, a herb that you may not know called henna, but uh, if you look at people from South Asia and the Middle East, often they'll uh, during wedding ceremonies, they'll put a dye on their hands and make very beautiful, intricate designs on their hands. Or uh, a lot of people of South Asian descent may dye their hair, uh, and it has sort of almost like a red tinge to it, and that's called henna. Um, and it's related to these naphthalquinones. And something to be aware of is that, for example, black walnut, the term black walnut, the black color basically comes from these nat naphthalquinones, and so they're natural dyes that have been used in the past to produce like a red-brown pigment. And so um, it's been used by indigenous people as a coloring agent, but these herbs are also used to fight off various infections, including bacteria and viruses and, and uh, parasites. Um, some herbs in this group have been used historically for cancer as well. So I know that um, Podarco has been used in South America as a cancer treatment. Um, so your main phytochemicals are things like juglone, and that's basically what you find in black walnut. So juglins Niagara basically means black walnut. And um, you have juglins Alba, which is just normal. Um, I think it's juglins Alba, which is just normal walnut, although I better not say that. Ignore that statement. i got to double check that. Um, Vitamin K is also um, a nutrient in our body that <clears throat> is a naphthalquinone structure. And vitamin K is involved in blood clotting, but it also plays an important role in helping protect us against heart disease and also with osteoporosis. So the, that's the black, black walnut tree on the left-hand side. This is my parents' property, and there's a number of these lining their property. Now something to be aware of with black walnut is both the leaves and the uh, husks of the um, nut itself contain the, uh, these uh, naphthalquinones and when it falls on the ground these naphthalquinones, just one second I'm going to check my phone and see if I've got a message here. I just got to check and make sure it's still recording. There's an issue over there. Yep, we're still recording. Sorry about that. So black walnut, one of the things that happens is when it drops its leaves and its seeds, it inhibits the growth of certain plants um, in the area. And it's one of the protective ways or one of the ways that it competes with other, other organisms. And so one of the challenges if you've got black walnut trees uh, on your property is you can't it can't grow too close to your garden. If you look at this is my parents' property, and there's just right near the edge of the tree. You can just start seeing the edge of our garden. 
And what ends up happening is periodically we got to go in there and basically dig up the roots from the black walnuts that are starting to encroach into the garden because it'll inhibit the growth of certain plants. And you just sort of see uh, as the as the tree gets older, it starts invading the garden and, and the uh, and the trees and the plants that are growing in there, the vegetables don't grow as well near closer to the black walnut tree. So, um, so the plant produces this basically to compete with other plants and also as a way to uh, probably protect itself from infection as well. So those are naphthoquinones. The big thing is they're used for uh, as an antimicrobial. Now the other group of compounds that are quinones are the anthroquinones. And when I hear of anthroquinone or anthroquinone glycosides, I basically associate this with primarily, almost exclusively, with stimulating laxatives. Um, and so herbs like uh, senna, rhubarb root, senna and rhubarb root, and also the resin of aloe vera, not the gel, but the resin of it, has this beneficial effect uh, uh, to help relieve constipation. I don't use these a lot in practice just because I find they're unnecessary. Usually I use other things like magnesium uh, citrate or glycinate uh, as a laxative to get the bowels working and then increase fiber when the bowels become more regulated. Um, but uh, they are stimulating laxatives. Something else to be aware of is that St. John's wort contains a compound called hypericin, which I think is probably responsible for the yellow color that you see in the flowers. And when you do an extraction with St. John's wort and oil, the oil will turn like a red yellow uh, color. And that's likely associated with these anthroquinones. And it may have some antiviral properties associated with it. Um, we do know that some of these anthroquinones, um, for example, rhubarb root, which is a laxative, is also used to clear heat in Chinese medicine. And it may be doing that just by evacuating, helping to evacuate the bowels, but I think directly it can be used as an antimicrobial as well to maybe fight off some kind of uh, dysbiosis in the gut. One of the things that you want to be careful about with the anthroquinones is that because they act as stimulating laxatives and they affect the um, the various salts, uh, the the, the um, um, in the lumen of the bowel, it can encourage the 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 transportation of salts into the lumen of the bowel, and that can also affect the levels of potassium and sodium in the blood. And as a result of that, um, if potassium levels get too low, it can cause some issues. And so. When you, if you were to combine anthroquinones with certain blood pressure medications and also with uh, certain heart medications, it could pose a risk. So I would use it with caution. It doesn't mean I wouldn't ever use it, but I would also have to evaluate who the patient is and decide if it's worth doing uh, or not. So here is what Senna on the left. It's Senacod is one of the classic anthroquinone glycoside products on the market. You can, I was just at the um, drugstore the other day and you can see it. Uh, right on the on the uh, uh, on the shelves, uh, St. John's Wort is is not really classified as a stimulating laxative, at least from my standpoint. Um, I've never really considered it to be that, um, but it does have some other properties associated with it, and it may just be that the structure of it is very different. Um, it's a more of a polymer of these anthroquinones rather than being. Um, a single one. So if you look at Amodin on the, at the top there, it's just a single anthroquinone glycoside with a few things, uh, or sorry, anth uh, anthroquinone with a couple things added to it. And then the center side at the bottom is more of an, a dianthrone, so it's like two of these anthroquinones stuck together. And then Hyperacin kind of has its own thing going on there. It's like, it's like a multiple um, benzene rings all connected there. And so maybe that prevents it from having that classic um, laxative effect. So we finished, I just want to see what time it is, we finished the um, the phenolic compounds and the related compounds and um, now we're going to move on to the alkaloids. Do we have any questions before I move on here? So, <clears throat> Grisha Ryan's asking me, in stores there are bottles of aloe juice. 
is that of the gel or of the resin? How can you tell the difference? So most of the products that you're going to buy in, um, I would say, in a grocery store, in a health food store, is probably going to be aloe vera gel. So the gel is primarily the carbohydrate component. And the resin, so if you take the aloe vera leaf and you squeeze it, and you squeeze it, all the clear substance is going to be the carbohydrates. That's the gel. Now, if you lift the, that, whatever is left over in the leaf, if you let it dry, and then you scrape off the inner resin of the leaf, it's, it has a yellow, very bitter taste to it. That's the resin. So the resin is not does not contain the carbohydrates. It contains these nonpolar compounds that act as a stimulating laxative. And so it's basically, in my opinion, aloe vera leaf has two completely different drugs in it. Aloe vera gel can act as a vulnerary and a bulk laxative. Aloe vera resin can act as a stimulating laxative. So the one is safe to take on a daily basis as a food, pretty much. The other one, you want to just be careful because one of the issues with the antiquinal like I said, you can only take it uh, for about 10 days before you develop a dependency on it. Uh, Katrina was asking, just wondering, were last, will last week's lecture recordings be posted? I think I already post, I posted them already, Katrina. Um, if we go over here, unless, oh, aren't, aren't these the lectures, yeah, these are the lectures, right? So can you guys not see those, or see that lecture there? So Katrina, you just double check and see, I think it's, it was posted, so. Uh, for some reason last week says unavailable. Well, I will investigate that. I posted it. Um, I'll, I'll have a look at that and see what's going on with it. So mine's working. I'll check that out on the break. So I don't know why it's says unavailable. Uh, okay. So the al alkaloids will do... We'll get through the alkaloids today. So the alkaloids are a group of phytochemicals that uh, the true definition is basically some kind of ring structure with a nitrogen group in it. Now, so when you hear the term alkaloid, think of nitrogen. Now you can have amino acids that contain a nitrogen group and they're pretty benign substances and they don't really do a whole lot. Uh, they can act as precursors for neurotransmitters in the body. Um, but uh, the amino acids themselves are, are safe and don't really have a, any real effects on the neurological system. Now alkaloids, a lot of the most potent drugs that exist are alkaloids and these are the ones that are pretty dangerous and if you think about it, because they contain nitrogens, they have the potential to interact with the nervous system. So, for example, epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, serotonin, dopamine, um, GABA as well, they all have, they all contain nitrogen molecules. So it's not surprising that a drug um, that contains nitrogens has the potential to interact with the nervous system. So when you think about certain drugs like the opiates, um, they have alkaloids in it and they can interact with opioid receptors. Uh, so they, these are very potent things and some of these uh, we use regularly and some of them are substances that you'll probably ever use in practice but I'll mention in, in passing anyways. So if you look through this, we've got all the different classifications of the alkaloids. Not all of these I think are really that significant um, when it comes to herbal medicine. Some of these I've used in practice, some of them I haven't, but I'm just going to mention them for the sake of being complete. Um, um, but I would say most of these compounds I probably ingested at some point in my life. Um, I'll have a look and see. I, I think I probably have. So we'll start off with the protoalkaloids. 
these technically speaking are not true alkaloids because they don't exist in a ring structure, but they get kind of thrown in with the alkaloid um, uh, classification. And so the protoalkaloids, you do have a nitrogen group. There is a ring structure, but the nitrogen is not part of the ring structure. And so these are going to be a lot of the uh, compounds that mimic neurotransmitters. So things like that will interact with the adrenergic or dopamine system are going to be um, considered protoalkaloids. So ephedrine, for example, um, it will interact with the primarily the adrenergic receptors in the body, uh, like epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, and has a little bit of an effect on dopamine as well. Other substances like mescaline, which is found in uh, peyote buttons, like pepper cactus, or in San Pedro's cactus that grows in, in Peru and South, uh, South America, contain uh, these protoalkaloids. And so mescaline is a potent hallucinogen um, that um, interacts with both primarily dopamine, but also with um, serotonin receptors as well to have profound hallucinations. It's used by shamans in Central and South America. Um, Another one is bitter orange, which is uh, con contains a compound called sinephrine, which is related to epinephrine and acts as a uh, stimulant, um, can elevate blood pressure and have those sort of negative effects, but it can also uh, increase, um, has a thermogenic effect. It can stimulate metabolism and also um, help with weight loss and has a few other properties. So for the most part, uh, pretty potent things. If you took too much of these, you probably could die from it, um, or at least feel really miserable. So if you were to take high amounts, you're going to have an increase in blood pressure, um, heart rate, anxiety, and uh, you could potentially get a hypertensive crisis and die from it. So uh, definitely want to use them with caution. Now also, obviously you would want to be cautious, uh, careful if you're pregnant, taking things like mescaline and uh, but more commonly like ephedrine and ephedrines I think you know what you're getting yourself into if you're taking mescaline when you're pregnant but um, maybe a woman might be taking a lot of cold medication that contains ephedrine that would be uh, a potential issue um, that you'd want to be careful about. So those are the protoalkaloids. Now we're going to start into the true alkaloids and the indole alkaloids will be the first group if you look at serotonin in the upper left there, that's the neurotransmitter in our body. And the rest of these compounds that are shown here contain this indole group. Now the indole group is what I've highlighted in pink there. You basically have a six-membered ring with a five-member ring that attaches It's aromatic in structure with a nitrogen group on there. And so a lot of the indole alkaloids are compounds that have a similar structure to serotonin and melatonin and will potentially interact with those receptors. And so dimethyltryptophan, for example, um, is a compound that we naturally produce in our bodies and it's used typically released when we have a near-death experience or when people are sleeping and having dreams. Uh, this compound is released. It's sometimes um, referred to as a spirit molecule so when, um, because it causes basically profound visions. This is the main active ingredient that you find in a few different hallucinogenic plants, including ayahuasca mixtures. And so the dimethyltryptophan, uh, it's interesting that it gets released from our pineal gland and has a, you know, an effect usually on us when we're unconscious or in very extreme circumstances. Um, but there are plants that contain this that can provoke or invoke or produce these uh, profound visions that we normally would only experience under really extreme situations when we're conscious or, or only when we're unconscious. Um, LSD, which is another hallucinogenic plant that interacts with serotonin receptors, um, also contains the indole alkaloid uh, structure. Uh, magic mushrooms contain this. So magic mushrooms, dimethyltryptophan, LSD, they all contain these compounds that are going to interact with, with uh, serotonin receptors. Um, another compound called ergotamine, it's a cousin of LSD, it's also found in the ergot fungus where LSD was extracted from, but ergotamine, it doesn't bind the receptors that cause us hallucinations, but rather it binds to serotonin receptor, receptors that are responsible for things like basal constriction. 
and so it's used primarily for uh, postpartum hemorrhaging and also for uh, migraine headaches because it's a very potent vasoconstrictor. It's a, uh, not the safest thing to use, but it definitely does work well. Um, another plant called reserpine. Uh, this comes from a plant from South America called, or not South America, from India called Rewolfia. Um, and it's used as a potent uh, blood pressure lowering substance. Um, and we'll talk, uh, we might talk about that some other time. Um, but the main structure for it is is this indole alkaloid uh, backbone. And there are other alkaloids in there. I can see another nitrogen in there, so it does have some other, comp, uh, some other uh, potential interactions as well. So I think going back to the indole alkaloids, I think the big take home message for these guys is it interacts with serotonin receptors. Uh, we, there are plants that we do use for this, uh, but the main effect is going to be serotonin is what I think when I think of indole. Piperidine. So piperidine alkaloids, there's a couple of them that um, I'm aware of. I don't know if it's as easy to make generalizations on these guys. Certainly there is potential for these compounds to interact with the nervous system. For example, Indian tobacco or pukeweed uh, contains one compound called lobeline that um, has a few effects we'll talk about in a second. Black pepper is probably the first compound where um, these piperidine alkaloids were extracted from. And there's also another substance called poison hemlock, which is obviously not something you want to be consuming high amounts of, if any at all. Um, and its toxic effect is related to these piperidine alkaloids um, that basically inhibit the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. <laughs> So, the, the uh, piperine, which is in black pepper, it's responsible for that pungent, hot effects or taste that you get from black pepper. I don't know what exactly it does. It does have a bit of an irritating effect to the mucous membranes, um, and that increases blood flow, so it can have a carminative effect on it. Sometimes combined with other uh, natural products to increase the absorption of certain uh, phytochemicals. Um, can also be used as a, as a spray for um, as an insecticide. Um, lobeline, which is another example, um, this is the main molecule that's used to induce, uh, to act as an expectorant. So it binds to certain receptors in the central nervous system um, and induces nausea and vomiting in high amounts, but in low amounts, uh, it's responsible for the expectorant effect. Now this compound in general, uh, has a couple other interesting properties. In traditional herbal medicine, Indian tobacco was used as a smoking cessation aid, and it may be that this compound here modulates dopamine receptors and it has an effect on that. Now, what they found in rats that were giving meth, uh, crystal meth um, is when they were consuming the lobeline, it basically reduced the dramatic effects of the release of the, the dopamine that is part of the pleasurable effects of doing something like crystal meth, but also the addictive component. And so they found if they gave these rats um, lobeline in combination that they didn't get the same peak or the same rush from it. And so it helped to decrease the addictive nature of it. And so this may be one of the properties of maybe one of the mechanisms of how uh, it could potentially be used for smoke, smoking cessation. So historically, what you typically do is um, before someone discontinues smoking, you usually give them the Indian tobacco for a period of time, um, and then they just sort of lose the urge to smoke because they're not getting the same pleasure response from it, and then they just sort of find it easier to go off of it. Um, finally, at the bottom right there, you've got conine. This is the main um, pyridine alkaloid that you're going to find in um, in water hemlock or poison hemlock and this is the same compound that basically killed Socrates um, when he was um, executed they gave him water hemlock to drink and it basically inhibits um, nicotinic receptors in the body and uh, messes up your nervous system as well as basically causes um, a flaccid paralysis so So the next group of compounds are the imidazoles. Now, 
there aren't a lot of these that are clinically significant. The only one that I can think of is is uh, pilocarpine, and pilocarpine is an important um, parasympathomimetic. Uh, so basically, this drug stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, and as a result, it increases uh, digestive juices. So you're going to have salivation, lacrimation. Um, you're going to have increase in stomach acid, increase in peristalsis, leading to nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, in the extreme case. Uh, it also has an effect on the eyes. So when you think about when someone, uh, this, the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, you'll have dilation of the pupil so you can let more air, uh, more light into your eyes so you can see um, large moving objects like bears easier. If you put eye drops of the imidazole alkaloids in, uh, sorry, of the pilocarpine in your eye, it'll cause constriction of the, of the people, and so that would be used for things like glaucoma potentially as an eye drop. This isn't a herb that you're going to use in practice, I don't think, very often. Uh, it's kind of dangerous uh, to use, well, it's not dangerous, I mean, it, everything's dangerous, but this is one of the more dangerous things just because it, an overdose could definitely cause death, so, um, but we don't generally use this. Uh, it is used in, in medicine as a as a drug, mainly for glaucoma, I, I believe. Now, a couple other compounds called pyridine and pyrolilidine uh, alkaloids. Um, pyridine alkaloids, you'll find this in vitamins like vitamin B3 or nicotinic acid is a um, sort of a precursor for, for vitamin B3. You also find these both in the nicotine molecule. So if you look at the molecule at the bottom there, it contains two ring structures or two different types of alkaloids in one structure. Um, and this may be one of the reasons why it can have, I, I don't know why it, does, why it has that structure, but it, certainly when you look at nicotine, it, it inter, interacts with the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, uh, the somatic nervous system, and it also interacts with the central nervous system as well and has effects there. So a lot of different effects on the nervous system related to nicotine, and it may be because it has two different types of alkaloids, so it can interact with lots of different receptors. So um, because it can stimulate these nicotinic receptors um, in various parts of the body, it has sort of mixed actions where it can both have a calming effect and a stimulating effect. Uh, in small amounts, it can increase salivation and higher amounts it can cause um, um, you know a dry mouth so um, that's nicotine it's a pretty interesting compound and these are some of the alkaloids uh, that are interacting with it for the exam purposes I don't think I really need you to go in and memorize the details on how many rings and all that kind of stuff just know the basic idea and what they're sort of some of, some of the examples of these guys. So pyrolilidine alkaloids and pyridine alkaloids are found in tobacco. I think I'd like, like you to know that, for example. I don't think you have to know that it's a six-membered ring or a five-membered ring with this attached or that attached. I don't think there's anything that I ask on, on that in the exam. Um, apart from the fact that the alkaloids all contain nitrogens and that most of them are ring structures except for the proto-alkaloids. Proto um, tropane alkaloids, I think, are significant class of compounds. The main structure of this is you've got this um, boat-like structure with the nitrogen in it, and the classic um, anticholinergic drugs like atropine or scopolamine, um, they're basically al uh, tropane alkaloids. And so deadly nightshade and, and jimson wheat, uh, their properties are associated with these basically these um, tropane alkaloids. Um, in addition, you also have cocaine does contain or uh, is a, um, um, uh, a tropane alkaloid. And so one of the things to appreciate with this is that um, these compounds are pretty potent drugs. Um, they can have different effects in the body. If you think about one of the actions is they act as analgesics. So if you've ever seen anyone who's or watched movies where people are doing a lot of cocaine, they're often doing this to their nose, and that's because cocaine acts as an analgesic and basically has a numbing effect uh, when it comes in contact with tissues. And so <clears throat> structurally, it's not that different from things like lidocaine um, and some other 
um, pharmaceutical analgesics. And so um, cocaine has that property, but also so does the deadly nightshade and, and jimson weed. Sometimes it's been applied topically uh, to help with pain as well. Um, some of them, most of the tropian alkaloids will have an anticholinergic effect. Cocaine doesn't have that property. It has a sympathomimetic effect. Uh, but the take home here is all three of those actions all have a pretty potent effect on the uh, on the nervous system. So here's deadly nightshade and jimson weed. What's interesting is both of these are in the Solanaceae family, which is the same family that tobacco is that tobacco is in. So the Solanaceae family does have a lot of drugs that contain alkaloids, um, and there are some pretty dangerous plants in that family. Now here's a picture on the left of coca leaf for sale in a market in Peru. Um, the main active ingredient in, in coca leaf is going to be cocaine. Now when indigenous people uh, chew coca leaf, it's completely different than snorting a line of cocaine or, or smoking crack cocaine. Coca leaf is more like consuming tea uh, because it has a nice slow release effect. In addition to the cocaine, it does have some other alkaloids like high green, which is a pure little bean alkaloid. And so consuming coca leaf is probably going to be, there's going to be lots of vitamins and minerals and nutrients and, and various phytochemicals and phenolic compounds, some cocaine and some of this high green. So uh, again, um, very different experience if you're just chewing on coca leaf versus doing something like cocaine. Uh, I would say the one is probably nutritious and safe. I would say the other one is very high risk um, to be doing. So I'm going to take a break right here. It's 10.34. Let's come back at 10.45. If you have any questions, write them down for me, okay? We will see you soon.
Okay, so we're back from the break. Um, with regards to, I had a question. I'll just answer really question, really quickly. Carly was asking, can you please explain the purpose of enterodial and enterolactone? These are the active ingredients of flax. Um, those two compounds are the lignans that basically get metabolized by your gut flora and get absorbed into your body and have a phytoestrogenic effect. So I, I believe that these are the, bio, the, the biologically active components of flax. So it sort of gets transformed by your gut flora and then becomes active and then it modulates various receptors in your body and <clears throat> uh, including possibly estrogen receptors. So that's what I know about flax and those compounds. Now, continuing on with the alkaloids, uh, we're going to start with a number of um, important compounds called isoquinoline alkaloids. Now, isoquinoline alkaloids, I probably use these compounds on a weekly basis without any doubt whatsoever. And the main actions associated with these compounds is going to be an antimicrobial action. When we were discussing um, the antibacterial herbs with the um, drug-resistant pumps, um, the berberine was the main antibacterial compound, and the flavonolignans were the compounds that had the multidrug-resistant pump inhibitor effects. And so berberine is one, probably the archetypal isoquinoline alkaloid, and you're going to find this in a number of herbs that are used as antibacterial and antiparasitics. Um, and so, for example, in Western herbalism, uh, we use for golden seal, barberry, Oregon grape. All three of these herbs contain these isoquinoline alkaloids. And berberine is the main one that's found in these. However, um, you will find things like hydrastine, which is unique to golden seal, that may have a more potent effect. Uh, certainly, golden seal is more expensive, and I think it's a better antimicrobial than Barberry and Oregon, Oregon grape, but um, I don't know if there's been any tests to compare the, the, the differences between the phytochemicals or those herbs in particular. Now, some other herbs that are worth mentioning in Chinese medicine, for example, there is a Chinese herb that's called coptis, and coptis is used to drain heat, and it's used in it as an antimicrobial. It's used for um, traveler's diarrhea, uh, and various types of uh, infections. And coptis contains berberine as well. And so I would say that coptis is sort of the equivalent of golden seal or barberry in Chinese medicine. Uh, and we'll have a lot of the similar properties. So um, in addition to that, uh, there's a few other compounds, or a few other herbs that we talked about, like chelidonium, or greater chelandine, uh, which is a herb that has antispasmodic effects. It also has some bitter properties associated with it. Um, it's used primarily for liver and gallbladder complaints. It's also applied topically to fight off warts, so there's an antiviral effect associated with it as well. Now, bloodroot, the main compounds in that um, are isoquinoline alkaloids, and some of those have escoriatic actions associated with it. So isoquinolines, in addition to acting as an antimicrobial, they can cause some damage to tissues as well, potentially. And I do know that uh, isoquinolines could have some of the things like both chelidonium and, and bloodroot have been shown to potentially um, have some hepatotoxic effects in high amounts. Now, another thing I'd like to mention is that in general, bitter herbs or quinoline, uh, sorry, alkaloid herbs are generally bitter to taste. Not all these herbs are going to have a bitter action associated with it. For example, uh, because if something like atropine, for example, it might taste bitter, but because of the effects that it has on suppressing the parasympathetic nervous system, it will not have a bitter action. Now, I would say most herbs that have a bitter taste, providing they don't directly inhibit 
the parasympathetic nervous system or stimulate the sympathetic nervous system will probably have a digestive bitter tonic associated with it. And when you look at, for example, golden seal, it's historically used as an antimicrobial, but it's also been used um, as a bitter tonic to help promote digestion. Now, I wouldn't use golden seal for this purpose as my primary indication, just because there's more cost-effective herbs out there that are that are just cheaper, frankly. Um, but so if I was using it primarily for digestion, I'd be more inclined to go with barberry or gentian or something else. But as a secondary action, if I'm treating someone for, let's say, dysbiosis, who may also have um, like hypochlorhydria, like low stomach acid or atonic digestion, like a sluggish digest digestion, I will get that as a secondary indication out of using these isoquinoline alkaloids as well. So, greater chalandine, Oregon grape, barberry, golden seal, uh, they've all been used for um, things like IBS or, or to stimulate digestion in general. Um, one other thing that's interesting is that we're going to talk about it in a second, in a second and that's quinine. Quinine is not an isoquinoline alkaloid, it's a quinoline alkaloid. But it's kind of neat to, to mention that berberine and some of these other compounds um, probably have an anti-malarial effect in addition to having antibacterial. I'm pretty sure these guys have antiviral actions, or some of them certainly do. Um, they also have antifungal actions. So it's a very broad acting antimicrobial. One other thing worth mentioning is that you'll see some products on the market now that are promoting berberine as a, hypo, as a hypoglycemic agent. I didn't mention it here mainly because I don't think berberine should be used to treat type 2 diabetes and there's a couple of reasons for this. One, the research, um, the last time I checked, it didn't look great for it. Um, my biggest concern is these isoquinoline, alkalo alkaline, uh, isoquinoline alkaloids in general Based on the structure, whenever you get, if you, if you know anything about chemistry, when you get a lot of these benzene rings stuck together, um, they could have the potential to slip between the various DNA molecules and could disrupt um, cell replication and, and have a potential to, to be mutagenic. And the reason why I'm saying that is, first of all, most of these isoquinoline alkaloids, I would say all these isoquinoline alkaloids are contraindicated during pregnancy and lactation because of this mutagenic effects. The other thing that you want to be aware of is that taking these short term, I don't think there's going to be any major risks associated with it. Um, golden seal for two weeks, maybe even two months, I don't see a concern with that. I would be cautious about recommending someone take berberine every day for the rest of their life to help with diabetes because it's not been used historically for that purpose. And so although berberine might have some hypoglycemic actions, in my opinion, it's becoming more like a new drug that needs to be tested and go through the same clinical trials that a new drug should go through to establish safety because it's not designed to be taken long term in high amounts. And so, um, when it comes to diabetes, we know that diet and lifestyle can reverse a lot of people who have got type 2 diabetes. And, and I'm sorry, when I say diabetes, I'm referring to type 2 diabetes, not type 1 diabetes. So I would not use berberine as a first line drug for diabetes. I'd rather use metformin, which is a prescription drug because it's, it's safe and effective. Berberine is not entirely safe. It's probably not that effective. And the research is very limited. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of using berberine for, for diabetes um, at this point until they've done more safety studies. It might prove to be safe. I'm just uncertain. And I can tell you right now there are other more effective ways to manage type 2 diabetes. So uh, that's just a little side note there. So here's a picture of golden seal on the left, barberry, Oregon grape. And what's interesting is all three of these herbs, they're basically distant cousins of each other. And I think it's neat when you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, you get the various families of plants and um, 
and um, <clears throat> what do you call the genus and species and, and um, families and there's another term I can't remember that stuff from way back when when I took it. Anyways, it's not surprising that we have when you have things that are related to each to one another that they're going to have phytochemicals that have probably evolved and that they're all going to contain these same types of phytochemicals together. Um, and so all three of these guys are great antimicrobials. Golden seal is my favorite, just harder to find and more expensive. Now the next thing is uh, the quinolines. So there's most probably just one quinoline molecule you need to remember, and that's quinine. So if you look at chinchona tree on the left hand side there, I took that picture in somewhere in South America, I can't remember. Uh, that's the plant that quinine comes from, and quinine is the main active ingredient that you'll find in tonic water. And so um, tonic water, the reason why they call it that is because it contains because it basically is a digestive tonic. It's used to stimulate digestion. So when you have a gin and tonic, for example, that's an aperitif that stimulates digestion. And it has very, very small amounts of the quinine molecule, which is the precursor for most of the, um, the uh, chloroquine-related drugs used for malaria uh, come from this compound or derived from this compound. Um, the this is probably one of the world's first and most effective anti-malarial uh, herbs um, that was discovered in, I think it was in Peru actually, several several hundred years ago. One of the issues now is that a lot of the chloroquine drugs on the market have become, mal malaria has become resistant to it. And I'd be curious to know whether or not the quinine tree and its extracts are more effective than the drugs or have less resistance. I'm assuming that quinine, the plant probably also contains some phytochemicals that help to decrease drug resistance. I'm just saying that that's my opinion. I haven't looked at the research or if it, I don't even know if the research exists, but um, the main action of quinine is it acts as an anti-malarial and it does act as a digestive bitter. Just like golden seal and barberry and Oregon grape can be used as digestive bitters, so does quinine. Now, I appreciate the fact that although quinine is a, a strong, potent compound, um, and when you're using it to fight malaria, there are some significant side effects associated with it. Uh, it can have a negative effect on the cardiovascular system, and it can also have a positive effect depending on how you look at it, but you can overdose and have uh, some serious um, uh, side effects associated with this. When you're drinking tonic water, you're taking very, very small amounts of quinine, so it's not going to really get to that toxic level uh, compared to when you're taking um, you know, the herb and, and drinking it as a tea. I've never actually recommended this. I would much prefer going with conventional means at this point because um, I'm not even sure how easy it is to get access to these herbs. But um, <clears throat> when it comes to um, the quinoline alkaloids, just remember that quinine is your archetypal molecule. It's an anti-malarial, antimicrobial, and digestive bitter. Um, and that's the main things you need to know about this guy. Now the quinolizidine alkaloids, these are less researched. There's not a lot of information on these guys. The main difference here is when you looked at the ring structure for the isoquinoline, you basically have two benzene rings stuck together. And when you look at the isoquinolines, the nitrogen's at the iso position. And that's going to be position number two on the on the ring where the nitrogen is attached. If you go to the quinoline molecules, you got the nitrogen at the one position. Now, the quinolizidine alkaloids, the nitrogen's right in the middle where the two rings connect. And so that makes it basically that nitrogen molecule has three different carbons attached to it. I don't know a lot of this. I'm kind of speculating on what these quinolizidine alkaloids do. I know that they're found in blue cohosh, and they're also found in another herb called Scotch broom, um, which contains methyl cyst cyst uh, cystazine, or methyl cystazine, and spartine. And what, what these are basically, the effects that these have is they do affect 
muscle contractions. Um, it may have an amen, or certainly blue cohosh has a pretty potent amenagogue effect that stimulates uterine contractions. Um, the spartine appears to have um, some effects on the cardiovascular system. It can have an antiarrhythmic effect. Um, I would say that in high amounts, these could have a negative effect. Certainly with blue cohosh, it was historically given to women who are having difficulties with um, delivering babies and it's given in the third trimester, but there's some major safety concerns with this. So I wouldn't recommend it um, to everyone, that's for sure. Um, and we can talk about it more. Some of the side effects associated with blue cohosh and high amounts could be cardiovascular complications. So something just to watch out for. Um, now the next group that we're going to go on to are the purine alkaloids. Sorry, I'm getting people. My phone's ringing and I don't like that. Um, purine alkaloids we've already discuss, discussed briefly. These are going to be also referred to as methylxanthines. Okay, so when we're talking about, for example, coffee and tea and chocolate, they have a lot of methylxanthines in here. And these methylxanthines, uh, in general, have a stimulant effect on the body. So if you have a cup of coffee, I think everyone knows what happens. Um, it basically stimulates the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So you'll see an increase in heart rate, better concentration, you feel less tired. In high amounts, uh, it could potentially elevate blood pressure, uh, act as a diuretic as well at any dose. Um, and a lot of these will also, because they have that bitter taste, um, people find that they also kind of promote digestion, so having a cup of espresso after a meal, whether it contains caffeine or not, can help promote digestion. And some of that may be related to the uh, alkaloids, the purine alkaloids, or it may be related to other compounds in the coffee as well. So um, the main compounds are going to be the caffeine, but there are other things in there. Theobromine is another one. Uh, there's also another uh, purine alkaloid purine alkaloid called theophylline. Um, it used to be used as a bronchodilator in, uh, as a pharmaceutical drug. It's no longer used because it's not that effective, but if you ever hear about that, it's in this class. Um, beyond that, the purine alkaloids, um, when people have gout, they may have elevated amounts of purines in their body, which is a breakdown from eating too much meat and and um, shellfish and a number of other things. Um, coffee might have a bit of a protective effect on that. Um, so it's related to these compounds as well, but um, the compounds found in plants are gonna be a little bit different than the ones you're gonna find in, um, in meat and stuff. So here's a coffee plant growing somewhere in the world. I think that's in Costa Rica, I believe that is. So the purine alkaloids, just remember they're stimulants. That's a big thing. Uh, and you find them in coffee and tea. Now, pyrolizidines, we mentioned these briefly. Pyrolizidine alkaloids are another one that you absolutely must know. Um, certain herbs, including comfrey, um, have been banned for internal use in Canada and certain countries because they contain pyrolizidine alkaloids. And when it comes to these pyrolizidine alkaloids, the structure of it, you got basically a couple five-membered rings with the nitrogen group in it, and there's going to be ones that are considered to be saturated and unsaturated pyrolizidine alkaloid, depending on if they have this nitrogen group or this double bond here or not. Now, I don't know what medicinal properties these could have, these pyrolizidine alkaloids could have. However, um, we do know that the unsaturated ones have the risk of causing uh, liver complications and so they're considered to be hepatotoxic. Now there are lots of medicinal plants that contain these ranging from comfrey, borage, colt's foot which is allowed to be consumed internally, also some other herbs like butterbur which is consumed internally, echinacea has small amounts or has some, some pyrolizine alkaloids in it, arnica uh, which you shouldn't be um, taking orally anyways because it's toxic. So there are lots of different plants that contain these things, and many of them 
uh, are considered unsafe for internal use, while other ones are considered to be safe. So you can do colt's foot. It's used in Chinese medicine. It's used in Western herbalism. Um, and it could just be a dose-dependent thing. Usually people who take colt's foot take it when they have a cold or take it for a few weeks at a time. They don't take it long term. Um, when it comes to the pyrolizine alkaloids, the thing to remember about these is that they're toxic. Um, and there are some health concerns with it. But again, the risk of the toxicity could be relatively small. It depends on uh, how much you're taking and how long you're taking it for. Both borage and cold foot are taking internally in herbal medicine. Uh, even uh, comfrey has been used by herbalists. The leaf is chewed and eat, eaten as a salad green in the, in the spring. Uh, the roots used internally for stomach ulcers. Um, but Health Canada is limited, limiting its use to just topical uh, because of these compounds. So, those are the alkaloids. The final group we're going to talk about are just some organosulfur compounds. There's a number of these compounds that we'll see mostly in our diet. So, the main families you get these are uh, that they're found in is going to be uh, the family that contains like the brassicas, so Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kale, things like that. Uh, and these are probably the compounds that when people eat Brussels sprouts, they get kind of stinky flatulence from it, sulfury smelling. I would imagine these guys contribute to it. Also, onions and garlic, scallions, which are in another family altogether, they contain a lot of these sulfur compounds as well, and they make are slightly different than the ones you're going to find in um, the brassicas. Now, sulforaphane is one of the compounds that's found in broccoli sprouts, for example, is very, very rich in these. And uh, I think they have a lot of potential for helping prevent uh, different types of cancer, and they may have some uh, benefits for, for um, cardiovascular, for the cardiovascular system as well. One of the things, I can't remember what all I've written about these. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead. One of the properties with the sulforaphanes is that they're involved in phase two conjugation. So remember when you have phase one detox, it can basically produce more reactive intermediates. And then phase two detox, basically take these toxic substances um, that have been formed in phase one and you stick them onto another substance and and sulforaphanes are often upregulate the phase two detoxification and I like I don't like stimulating phase one detox too much because you could get reactive intermediate so when you eat barbecue foods or you smoke or other things or the aflatoxins um, it's the liver that makes them more toxic during phase one and then the phase two usually has sort of a, a protective effect sort of stick something on to make it easier to excrete. Uh, so the sulforaphanes in um, Brussels sprouts and broccoli sprouts will basically help to um, upregulate phase 2 detox and I think that's a good thing to do. So eat your broccoli, it's good for you, or kale, or Brussels sprouts or whatever. Um, another thing, some other compounds, cysteine and methionine, which are amino acids in our diet, um, they are rich in sulfur compounds. And we do know that, for example, cysteine um, is used in phase two conjugation as well. So, <clears throat> um, for example, the antidote for tylenol, tylenol overdose is taking NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine, which is basically the amino acid cysteine with an acetyl group on it, just to stabilize it. Doesn't doesn't really have any functional effects. Um, and so I kind of wonder if you give any kind of sulfur compound in your diet, if it has that protective effect against some of these, um, something like Tylenol, or whatever has a, has a protective effect, mainly because the sulfur somehow gets recycled and converted into whatever they need it to. So, so sulfur, take home here is remember that it's involved in uh, phase two detox pathways. Garlic in general is a really good antimicrobial. It also contains a number of sulfur compounds. And one of the things with garlic is that when you have fresh garlic that's raw, 
there's a compound called aline, which in the presence of oxygen, so when you crush it, it releases an enzyme called alinase, which then basically forms new compounds like allicin. And allicin is going to be one of the chief components that has a um, um, an antimicrobial action. It's, it's a fairly reactive compound. You can get this in the stabilized form as a supplement. I'm not going to promote the company that does that. Uh, or you could also take fresh garlic, just crush it up and eat it if you've got a cold, or add it to olive oil and put it in your ear if you've got an ear infection, and it's pretty effective. Now, one of the things that happens is over time, the allicine will become uh, oxidized and can form basically these compounds like um, a a a a a ahoine and diallyl disulfide, and these two compounds are probably um, going to be found in a lot of the aged garlic extracts and so there's two different types of garlic products on the market. One of them is mostly promoted because it's high in allicin or allicin and this is given more for infections I would say. Uh, it's an antifungal, antibacterial, fights off candida, can't tell, uh, fights off the common cold. Uh, works pretty good. I like it. We have it in our clinic. It's expensive. Um, and then you have the aged garlic extracts that essentially will not have the allicin in it because it's been oxidized over time and fermented. But these compounds have, have um, or these products have compounds that appear to have a good blood pressure lowering effect and cholesterol lowering effect as well. And I, I'm pretty certain they all will have some beneficial, beneficial effect on phase two detox. So, um, so if you're looking for a product that uh, a garlic product to um, <clears throat> basically fight infections, I would be more likely to go with ones that are high in the allicin that's stabilized. And if I'm looking for something for cardiovascular disease, you could use either the ones that contain the allicin or the aged garlic extracts. But the aged garlic extracts are a little bit more cost effective, uh, I think. So we're a little ahead of schedule here. Um, what I might do, let me have a look at this. So I might end it here and just make sure that I can get through the safety lecture in next week. Yeah, I might just modify the lecture, make sure I have it all, I can get through it all in one, uh, one lecture. Uh, and then I'll leave the preparations that I'll get through in one lecture as well. So do you guys have any questions? Um, okay, a uh, couple questions. Gershwin is asking, is the final exam cumulative? Um, it is more kind of. And the reason why I'm saying that is that uh, I'm not going to test on the intro lecture. All the herbal actions that we discussed at the beginning of the term are mentioned in the second half of the term, but um, but I'm not going to go back into the information before the exam and ask you exam questions on that. But you, but all that stuff's reappearing in the second half. So yes, it is cumulative, but you might want to go and review those notes in the beginning, but you don't have to, I'm not going to pull questions from the first half of the term. Um, another question, someone just wants me to repeat phase one and phase two detox. So when it comes to Tylenol, for example, if you have Tylenol and it gets metabolized in your body, what happens is Tylenol gets, goes through phase one detox and it generates a reactive intermediate. And this is basically the Tylenol molecule with free radicals stuck on it. And if that molecule is not uh, conjugated or it's something else isn't attached onto it right away, that Tylenol molecule will start attacking the liver and reacting with the, with the liver and, and using those free radicals to damage the liver. And so what happens is it requires something that you stick onto it, and that's called phase two conjugation, where you take two molecules and you stick them together, 
so that it can easily be excreted from the body. So the way I kind of remembered it originally was phase one uses only one molecule, so Tylenol. Phase two uses two molecules, Tylenol and let's say cysteine, and links them together. When you link something together in phase two detox, it makes it more water soluble or easier to excrete, generally speaking. Uh, could make it more fat soluble too, I guess. Uh, but you're basically making it easier for the body to excrete it so it doesn't get hang around. Hang around. Um, so that's that. Um, so why don't we end it a little early. The only thing I'm worried about is I might need a little extra time for um, I might not be able to get through everything and do the exam review at the same time. I might have to figure out a way to just post a quick little exam review as a separate lecture because I'm going to use probably all of the next lecture to get through um, the herbal safety stuff and then the following week to get through the different herbal preparations. But I'm going to go look at that stuff now. Uh, any other questions before we go? We good? Okay, so you guys have a great week then, and I will see you next time. Uh, and can you guys confirm whoever was having issues with the um, uh, with Moodle of posting lectures? Just please confirm that it's up there working now, okay? Okay, so you guys have a great week. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.